The arena type auditorium seats 12,000 people. All of these facilities, as well as those for archery, shooting, and equestrian activity, are already in existence or in the very advanced stages. An absolute assurance can be given that to the extent not presently available, these facilities can and will be provided. People coming to the games here in America's heartland will find plenty of places to stay. 45,000 comfortable motel and hotel rooms are within one hour's drive. Now I want to establish firmly the financial responsibility and capacity of Detroit, USA, to make the 1968 Olympics an outstanding success. First, let's look at the fiscal soundness of Detroit, as demonstrated by the budget for 1962-63, a budget well over $350 million. We're proud to say that this budget has been balanced realistically and is based on conservative estimates of revenue from all sources. Detroit has never been so financially healthy. As for industrial worth, the true industrial value of the six county area we call metropolitan Detroit is reckoned in the billions. Especially dramatic is the city of Detroit's municipal development. Since 1952 and planned for by 1967, Detroit's taxpayers have put well over a billion and a quarter dollars in capital improvements. As for commerce, Detroit, because of the St. Lawrence Seaway, now handles a greater number of imports and exports than any other port of entry in the entire United States except New York City. Retail sales in metropolitan Detroit total over $5 billion. Today, Detroit produces more wealth per capita than any other city in the United States. 71% of Detroiters own their own home a record among the nation's population centers. We are a fiscally stable, Olympic-minded community. I believe that we have convincingly portrayed our ability, our facilities, and our determination. The basic purpose, as we understand it, in staging an Olympiad is to light the Olympic torch in all parts of the world. We have graphically demonstrated that Detroit, our city is centrally located for over 90 million people in the United States. Everyone in our area supports the Olympic bid. The service clubs, the high schools, the college students, the leadership and membership of the great international labor unions that are headquartered in our city, businessmen, educators, city councils in Michigan and surrounding areas, mayors in most of the major Midwestern cities, what I'm saying, in effect, is that the men, women, the children of all the races and all the diverse national origin groups have voiced their support for Detroit's efforts. Now let's get down to our program for financing the 1968 Olympic Games. Most of the facilities, as mentioned earlier, are already in existence. I might add standing and paid for. We are concerned here with the financing and construction of two major projects. First, Olympic Village. The city of Detroit, along with Wayne State University, is already committed to the fulfillment of this city within a city, which will be a dynamic part of the Wayne State University campus. Second, the new stadium. In Detroit's quest for the 1968 Olympics, the Michigan legislature has established a public authority to finance and operate this stadium. And now to tell you about this legislation, it gives me great pleasure to present the Honorable George Romney, Governor of the State of Michigan. Governor? Thank you, Mayor Kavanaugh. Our state legislature has taken almost unanimous action. It's passed three measures. First is Act Number 1218, creating a state recreation and building authority to issue bonds and build a stadium. Second, while we only need a million three hundred and sixty thousand to pay the principal and interest on this stadium, the second act, number 1219, provides a million six hundred thousand of additional revenue annually. It might surprise some of you to know that this year Michigan will have a surplus of thirty-four million dollars, and we'll have a surplus next year. The stadium bonds will be paid for from the state's general revenue. Third, the legislature, by concurrent resolution, has created a joint House-Senate committee 
to make sure that the legislature does the additional necessary things to bring the Olympiad to Detroit. These actions show that Michigan means business. When the question was raised about Detroit's ability to finance the games, the whole state rallied spontaneously to support this financing program. I know of no major legislation that has ever gone through the Michigan legislature as rapidly as this. And this is so that we could present a firm and adequate program so that we can be sure that the 1968 Olympiad will be held not in a 1932 model stadium, but in a 1968 model. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor Romney. The joint efforts of Detroit and Michigan provide a double assurance of the financial ability and stability of Detroit, USA, to put on the finest celebration of any city in the world. The Olympic Games. Hosting an event of the sheer physical scope of the Olympics is a big job for any city. An enormous job, requiring not only proper facilities and financing, but also firm resolve on the part of the entire community. A can-do resolve, rooted in a can-do record of comparable achievement. Before a city can properly host and handle the Olympic Games, it must understand fully what those games are, and always have been, and always must be if the basic ideal of the Olympiad is to be properly preserved and presented. The Olympics are far more than a major athletic event. It is vitally important to perpetuate the ageless ideal behind the games and the larger role they play in kindling the flame of international peace. Detroit, USA fully understands what it is asking to do. Detroit knows that it is asking to take on a sacred trust, one that transcends logistical considerations that reach into every resource of the city, important as those practical considerations are. Detroit, USA has the people who know the importance of following through, just as we have always followed through in time of world, national, and community need. We are proud of our record of getting big jobs, seemingly undoable jobs, done. It's a record unsurpassed by any city anywhere in the world. But not surprising when you consider that Detroit pools one of the world's greatest reservoirs of organizational talent, the kind of men the country and the community have called on before to move mountains, and who ask only, where would you like them moved and by when? These men are attracted to Detroit by the unique demands of America's number one industry, the pivot point of the nation's economy, the kind of men who like nothing better than being told something can't be done because they've never done it before. For example, it was said that no city could ever coordinate its various charitable fundraising efforts into a single unified drive and realize anywhere near the money needed. Detroit did it and is still doing it. Detroit's United Foundation Torch Drive has raised more money for charity than any city in the world. Twenty million dollars last year alone. More important, Detroit has surpassed its goal every year without a single year's exception for 14 consecutive years. An unparalleled example of follow-through on every level of Detroit's civic and business life. Remember 1945? when the big job was to get the national economy back on course, there were dire predictions from every quarter that Detroit couldn't reconvert its assembly lines to peacetime needs and peacetime production almost overnight to get the country back on the road. Detroit did that too, gaining a reputation for its ability to shift its gears under the press of deadline and the pressure of need. We remember the time when it was said that Detroit because of its preoccupation with building cars, could never become a culture center. 